Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists, they did. They absolutely got it correct. And as we consider all that is going on in history uh, and our present, it's just amazing is that our present is creating our history. This is Tom Novolis, your host. And today I do want to take you through uh, un known territory for the majority of modern people. I want to talk about de Tocqueville and his book, his great writing, Democracy in America. Very, very few people have uh, any knowledge of the book whatsoever. But what I have been enjoying in rereading de Tocqueville here lately is the fact that uh, his writings in so many ways of democracy in America clearly uh, distinguish and outline the views regarding the principles of Christian nationalism. And we're going to get into that in the detail. We're going to talk about some other historical perspectives. We're going to talk about the destruction of our heritage from this point of view, because this history is no longer taught. It's lost. Now, I understand there are some universities, uh, some college professors, even some political minds that are somewhat uh, going back and looking at de Tocqueville just to get an idea of what he saw in 1830 when he came to America to review what was going on in American prisons, the American penal system. De Tocqueville and all of Europe were surprised that there were so few people incarcerated in America, in the United States. And the question was why. It was baffling when they were having so many issues and problems there in Europe, and in France in particular. Now, we're not going to get into the conclusion of this massive work. We're just going to touch on just the inferences in particular to what it means around Christian nationalism. And you're looking at me and going, Tom, how are you going to tie all that together when de Tocqueville was a Catholic to begin with? Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean that he didn't understand the very same biblical principles that a lot of Protestants have forgotten. In fact, when we look at what, oh, some of the senators are doing now, and if we look at, oh, interesting, is that uh, Rand Paul actually commented to the fact that the U.S. Senate are cowards. Uh, I am paraphrasing. I'm not using his exact words. But basically, they're always kowtowing and giving in to the Democrats who we know are evil. So let me stop there for a moment, and let me rewind back to the beginning. Let's look at uh, just this, one of this initial quotes in chapter 2 of uh, de Tocqueville's writing. And chapter 2 is dealing with the foundation, the very beginning, the essence of the founding of America. De Tocqueville writes this, and it says, quote, It must not be imagined that the piety of the Puritans was of merely speculative kind, or that it took no cognizance of the course of worldly affairs. Puritanism, as I have already remarked, was scarcely less a political than a religious doctrine. No sooner had the emigrants landed on the barren coast described by Nathaniel Morton then it was their first care to constitute a society by passing the following act. 
And here he quotes. He goes on. In the name of God, amen. We, whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, etc., etc., having undertaken for the glory of God an advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage of a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do these present solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid and by virtue hereof do enact, constituted, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience, etc. What was very interesting in this, that first covenant, if you will, declaration is that, as we know, those folks that landed in now what would later be called the Massachusetts colony fundamentally had no government that came with them. There, there was no charter really at that time. De Tocqueville really talks about this exceptionally well, and we're going to cover some of that throughout the course of uh, today. But what is very, very clear is that when we talk about the Puritans and Puritanism, what de Tocqueville was bringing out at the very beginning and the foundation of the northern colonies in particular, it is the fact that Puritanism was as much political as it was religious. It was the understanding of Scripture to the extent of what did it mean to develop nationalism, to develop an environment of what? Of governing. And when you govern, it takes and it solidifies what? How you become as a people. De Tocqueville definitely distinguishes this during the whole beginning of the book and develops the facts that if it was not for the ideals, the fundamentals, the principles of Puritanism, which is founded on a complete understanding of Reformation biblical thought, you're not going to have a good civil government. Geez, that's where we are today. We are no longer, as we're seeing with some kind of fool that runs around in a dress with a bald head stealing luggage, he is a fool. He is a fool because he is living in folly, and he perpetuates that folly no different than any of the other persons that are in a contrarian concept when it comes to what does it mean to govern, and that you have to have a moral society to govern clearly and properly. Therefore, as we're seeing in all of the various, what I'll call, democrat cities and states, is a total meltdown of society, is the idea that, geez, you can get away with whatever you want, and and that it's all fine for all these immoral activities, including drugs, to the extent that they're destroying and killing over 300 people a day. So where's the statistical numbers in comparison relative to what was happening with the debacle called COVID? 
Yes. Where are the statistics that are showing that 300 Americans a day are dying from the drugs that are coming in over the border? What's going on with that? The illegals, and this is what's going to be very, very interesting, is all the illegals, as I've talked about in previous programs and recently previous programs, is they have no concept of Puritanism. They have no concept of Reformation principles. They have no concept of God principles. You must understand is that a lot of them that are coming in from Central and South America, if they have any concept of religion at all, it is the social gospel under the socialist that are there as the religious leaders. That just doesn't fly. So their expectation is that they're going to be taken care of no different than the political ills that were going on in and are going on, quite frankly, as we know, like in Chile, where it's being said that it's $26,000 a day is what the revolution Aries the revolution Aries are costing the people of Chile is 26 million. I'm sorry, it's not 26,000, 26 million dollars a day. Wow, how much is it costing us for all the illegals that we have then that are coming up from South and Central America, from Africa, from even other, gosh, what is it? Asian, Central European, even those from the Middle East that are coming into America. It is costing our cities millions and millions of dollars a day on the taxpayer, the local taxpayer. So when we're taking and we're looking at the fundamental principles and the founding of the nation being that from a basics of Christian nationalism, we're going to continue to look at de Tocqueville and what he has to say about this. And we're going to go back to some of the early components of it, and uh, I will take and start you through some of that as we're looking at this chapter here. It's called Chapter 2, Section 1 is none other than the origin of the Anglo-America. And in some of that, there, quite frankly, there there was a problems depending on where the settlements were going in. We're going to talk about that in particular because, as many will argue, or I should say instead of because, because now I'm talking Southern, it's because, as we understand it, there were problems. So let us me start with this in this last minute. De Tocqueville starts this chapter out in part one and talking about that to understand what the makeup of a man is going to be, you have to understand what the inputs are into a child. Now, we can take that right there alone and look at what's happening in American society, in the United States society, even in global society, with all of this trans stuff, with all of the ESG, with all of the de debauchery and confusion that is being brought in by those that do not have those fundamental biblical Reformation backgrounds. And he says is that when you take and you look at a child and what's being put into that child, even in the cradle, the entire man is, so to speak, to be seen in the cradle of a child. That's a direct quote from de Tocqueville. And he says, guess what? Nations are the same way. And the fact is, is that Europe was so far along, you could not go back and look at the cradle. Whereas in America, you were able to. Sam Adams clearly understood that. De Tocqueville is wrapping the packaging around that for us. And we're going to find out more on what de Tocqueville has to say on how a nation grows and 
the America in particular when we come back to Samuel Adams Returns. See you in a few minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this second segment of Samuel Adams Returns. And as we begin to look through Democracy in America, Volume 1, and we're in Chapter 2, Section 1, in particular to take and see here that uh, he outlines Christian nationalism, which is really controversial for some reason. Well, I'll tell you why is that if you look at those that are the political elite, if you look at all of those that uh, do not have the depth and substance of what it means in reference to even religion on the surface, let alone a deep practicing sense of God in all things, then, yeah, the, the, the whole idea of it is bizarre the idea of, of Christian nationalism. And, and really, what is just does not boggle my mind, I would almost say it does boggle my mind, is that there's so many Christians out there that are uh, just battling along in this. No, what is that? That's crazy. That's radical. That's da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Well, it's simple. They don't have the theology of the founding of the nation, nor do they want it because they have all these other expectations of what does it mean for the sovereign of the universe to be sovereign. You know, they're establishing what I call partial sovereignty you know, when it comes to God. They, even in so many different ways, you could say it's partial concepts of Christ's work of salvation instead of acknowledging him as the king of the universe, the king of kings, the owner and redeemer of every atom, every concept, every moment in time. Anyway, we must move on because some of the areas that we want to talk about here are how did America develop as de Tocqueville was able to discern it from his journey to America back in the 1830s. And uh, some of which I'm going to just go through and do some quotes because I think it's more practical to hear de Tocqueville speak for himself than me to take and try and give you an analysis. Now, as I mentioned before, what he's looking at is that uh, after the birth of a human being, his early years are obscurely spent in the toils or pleasures of childhood. As he grows up, the world receives him when his manhood begins and he enters into contract with his fellows. Now, there, it's very critical to understand that as a child, you're, the, you know, we're within the concept of our families, but when you mature and you're going into manhood or a woman goes into society, into womanhood, now you're contacting and you're in contact and you're in contracts and you're in developing relationships is what he's talking about. So what it says here in the Tocqueville says he is then studied for the first time when he goes out as a man in adulthood. And it is imagined that the germ of the vices and the virtues of his mature years is then formed. But that's a mistake. The Tocqueville takes it all the way back and says, no, it's a great heir. It all begins in the cradle, in his infant, in his mother's arms. We must see the first images which the external world cast upon the dark mirror of his mind. Uh, right there, there is the psychological analysis and proving the destruction of the youth from a thinker in the past, from an observer of humanity, to the point that all that is being done in the educational system, all that's being done with all this wokeness, transgenderness, all of that falls right back there to the child and the harm that is done to a child will be reflected when they become adults. And anybody 
Any psychobabalist out there that thinks differently and spews the lies is just flat out evil. They're planning to destroy that youth. Well, anyway, he goes on to talk about nations. They take and they grow in the same way. And as I mentioned in the last segment, you know, for Europe in, the mo in particular, there was no capacity to look back into history and to have those observers the way that it was and is in America from our point of view. At least that's what de Tocqueville believes. Even the ancient writings were not sufficient from his perspective to bring out all of that information that was necessary to see how did that nation really form from the very utterance of its beginning. So he goes on to talk about, and he develops that, uh, what are the national characteristics? How did they form? Uh, he looks at what he calls a word, which we don't use because we don't use language the way it used to be used, is a physiognomy. Physiognomy is your face. How does your face look at, look at, are you European? Are, are you Germanic? Are you French? Are you Italian? Are you uh, Spanish? Are you Middle Eastern? What is your physiognomy in how you look is also a part of then the character that you have based on your historical background or the background of your family, what's going on in the society at that time. And he goes on to say that when we look at all of this in America as a country, and when we look at world nations and all of that, they had already attained a stage of civilization, this is um, in the Americas in particular, at which men are led to study themselves. They have transmitted to us a faithful picture of their opinions, their manners, and their laws. In 1830, they were getting this total understanding. And he goes on to say is that the men of the 16th century are almost as well known to us as our contemporaries. America consequently exhibits in the broad light of day the phenomena which the ignorance or rudeness of earlier ages conceals from our researchers. Well, I'm going to tell you right there, I look at ignorance or rudeness by not even reading the Tocqueville or some of the other fundamentals that bring this together. That's where we are. In the churches, as much as in the political environment and in education in particular. Now, de Tocqueville goes on in talking about the America founding, and he has this unique first concept, if you will, of what I do say is the introduction to Christian nationalism. Providence has given us a torch which our forefathers did not possess and has allowed us to discern fundamental causes in the history of the world which the obscurity of the past concealed from them. Now, that's interesting. He talks about providence. Then he goes on to talk about the immigrants who came from uh, came here to America at different periods to occupy the territory uh, which we have in the United States. Their aim was not the same, and they governed themselves on different principles. These men had, however, certain features in common, and they were all placed in the analogous situation. The tie of language is perhaps the strongest and the most durable that can unite mankind. All the immigrants spoke the same tongue. They were all offsets from the same people, born in a country which had been agitated for centuries by the struggles of faction and in which all parties had been obliged in their turn to place themselves under the protection of the laws. Their political education had been perfected in this rude school, and they were more conversant with the notions of right and principles of true freedom than the greater part of their European contemporaries. In the period of their first emigration, 
the parish system, that fruitful gem of free institutions was deeply rooted in the habits of the English, and with it, the doctrine of the sovereignty of the people had been introduced to them, what? Into the bosom of a monarchy in the house of Tudor. Now, he goes on with all of this, is that the religious quarrels which have agitated the Christian world were then rife. England had plunged into a new order of things and, he and headlong vehemence. The character of the inhabitants, which had always been sedate and reflective, became argumentative and austere. Here it goes. He talks about here that the general information had been increased by intellectual debate and the mind had received a deeper cultivation. Whilst religion was the topic of discussion, the morals of the people were reformed. All these national features are more or less discoverable in that physiognomy of the most adventurers who came to seek out the new world on the opposite shores of the Atlantic. Now he goes on, and you know, so let me stop a second. Let me let me get into this because what we don't have anymore, we don't. We may have some commonality in in language, but not really anymore, because of the great amount of illegals that are coming in. I, it's impossible to educate properly, and to educate in the fundamentals of Americanism. So. A number of years ago, I did a survey for a church that was trying to understand better its community. And in that, I sat and spoke with principals of the schools, the local schools that served that particular community. At that time, which is over a decade ago, all, you know, almost, let's see, that, that was well over a decade ago. At that time, there were 10 languages that were being spoken in that grammar school. The principal was going, how do we educate? How do we take and ensure that the students are learning at a common level? So the cost of education is the children being left behind. And got to remember, that was when no child left behind was really the big, you know, number one thing. So the children were being left behind because there were insufficient numbers of people that could take and bring in the concepts of just language and let alone all that is required to be able to teach and mathematics and reading in all of the other arts of primary education. Well, one of the key topics that he talks about here is the morals of the people were reformed. The morals of the people, and I take that from reformed in two different ways. They were being reformed within the concept of the religion's of the time in Christianity and especially in the battle of Protestantism coming to a higher level of knowledge and understanding within all of Europe that it came down to the idea that what is democracy based on that? What is democracy as it was outlined from that biblical perspective? Well, Democracy is only a smidgen of what it means to have a good governing group of people. And as we talked about and what I read in that introduction, it really began with covenant between the people, and then the electoral process is the only democratic component that was biblically sound even back at the founding of America when, what, the Puritans landed. 
When we come back in the next segment of Samuel Adams Returns, we're going to talk about 1607 and more in the founding of America from de Tocqueville's perspective and what does that mean in Christian nationalism. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this third segment of Samuel Adams Returns. This is Tom Navolis, your host. I do hope that all of you in the various markets that are out there that only get the uh, first and third segment, that you would go to samueladamsreturns.net and uh, listen to the whole podcast or accelerate your uh, little cursor over to the uh, 15 minutes and get into the second segment and follow, catch, catch what I was talking about and what de Tocqueville was explaining in so many different ways and some of the other analysis and present interactions that I discuss in there and the, uh, what's happening in America. So let's get to where de Tocqueville really talks about the two branches that distinguish the Anglo-American family, that being the North and the South, and that Virginia was the first English colony. The immigrants took possession in 1607, and their whole idea was to come after gold and silver as a primary resources, and national wealth was their single uh, prevalent European idea. Uh, it was a fatal delusion, is what de Tocqueville writes, uh, which has done more to impoverish the nations which adopt it. So if a nation is chasing after uh, wealth, if they're chasing after gold and silver and other mechanisms of wealth, it will surely destroy them. And we see that. We see that in, a, in South America. We see that in, uh, in particular in Africa, that they're chasing after wealth, or at least the leadership. Or in, we're seeing the destruction of Europe even more so from what de Tocqueville was talking about. Germany, wealthy country, but the people are being enslaved. So de Tocqueville was very clear on that. When you talk about those that uh, take and chase after it, as it is in Europe at that time, even more so now, it's a fatal delusion is how he terms it. Uh, then uh, the united influences of wars and bad laws come along. So when Virginia, well, we see that they were seekers of gold, adventures, uh, without resources and without character. Those turbulent and restless spirit endangered the infant colony, and it rendered its progress uncertain. So then the artisans and agriculturists arrived afterwards, and although they were more moral than uh, the orderly, more moral and orderly race of men, they were in no ways above the level of the inferior classes in England. Now, that's very interesting. When the artisans came and all of that, and the agriculturalists, they were basically the inferior class, lower class portions of England. And uh, he has references in here uh, to that point in the history of Virginia and what he's talking about and uh, all the footnotes that he has. Now, what he goes on is that no lofty conceptions, no intellectual system directed the foundation of these new settlements down there in Virginia. The colony was scarcely established when slavery was introduced. And this was the main circumstance which has exercised so prodigious an influence on the character, the laws, and the future prospects of the South. He just identifies. It goes back to, you know, what do you feed the baby? Uh, what do you put in their minds? What do you put in their bodies? This is what they turn out to be. So slavery, as uh, we shall afterwards show, this honors. Listen to this, because you got to remember, big business, China, all of these other world globalists, blah, blah, blahs, what they're trying to do is make everybody slaves, that, you know, it's economy, economy, economy. I talked about that in a number of different uh, programs. Well, he says here that slavery does what? Dishonors labor. It introduces idleness into society. And with idleness, then ignorance and pride, luxury and distress. 
It invenerates the powers of the mind and benumbs the activity of man. In other words, it cuts down your use of your brain. So then you can have the demon crap party, Black Lives Matter, and all these other psychobabblists taking and directing you because now what we have are so many people out in the American society that are slaves to government in one way or another. The whole welfare system has made slaves to government. And de Tocqueville was talking about them. You know, he, he mentioned it there. The influences of slavery united to the English character explains the manner and social conditions of the South. Very interesting. Now, what he talks about next is he goes into the North. Oh, just to give you a point is that the slavery was introduced about 1620 by Dutch vessel, which landed 20 Negroes on the bank of the James River. Isn't that crazy? Crazy. So, in the North, the same English foundation was modified by the most opposite shades of character. And he goes into detail here. He goes, two or three main ideas which constitute the basis of social theory of the United States were first combined in the northern English colonies, more generally denominated in the state of New England. The principles of New England spread at first to its neighboring states, and then it passed successively to more distant ones, and by length they imbued the whole confederation. Now they extend their influence beyond the limits of the whole American world. The civilization of New England has been like a beacon lit upon a hill, which after it's diffused, it's warmed and abound and, you know, it tingled and glowed on the horizon. But not now. Think about it. Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, all of those original colonies that were bastions of liberty are now the center the heart of liberalism, socialism, and even communism. They are destructive in every manner opposite to the founding of this nation. Now, we'll go on to look here real quick, is that the settlers established themselves on the shores of New England all belonged to the most independent class of their native country. Their union on the soil of America, once presented as a singular phenomenon of society, is that they were more than just common people. They weren't rich. They weren't poor. These men possessed, in proportion to their number, the greater mass of intelligence than is to be found in any European nation of our own time. Whoa! Uh, that was de Tocqueville you know, talking and coming here in 1830 and writing in 1850, and he said that the founders of America that came in the 1620s into New England had a greater intellect than all of Europe in his time. Can't say that so much for America anymore, can we? We've really digressed. Oh, we got a bunch of smart people out there, but most of them anymore are overly, I, I guess you can get so smart you're stupid. You know, I've heard that said before. So when we look at that is that they received good educations before they even came to America, but the emigrants of New England brought with them the best elements of order and morality. And they came not just by themselves as they did down in Virginia, but they actually came with their whole family. But what most especially distinguished them was their aim of their undertaking. 
they had not been obliged by necessity to leave the country, leave England. No, they did it, and they did it on their own, and they came, and what they brought was purely their intellectual backgrounds, and in facing inevitable suffering of exile, their object was the triumph of the idea. The emigrants deservedly styled themselves the pilgrims. Belong to the English sect, the austerity of those principles had acquired for them the name Puritans. Puritanism, as I quoted at the beginning, Puritanism was not merely a religious doctrine, but it corresponded in many points with the most absolute democratic and republican theories. It was this tendency which had aroused its most dangerous adversaries, those back in big government, persecuted by government of the mother country, and distinguished by the habits of a society opposed to the rigor of their own principles. The Puritans went forth to seek some rude, unfrequented part of the world where they could live according to their own opinions and worship God in freedom. So anyway, he goes on with a few quotations here, and I'm not going to get into that in the last few minutes, but what I want to say here is when we take and we start looking at who the Puritans were and that it was not merely religious doctrine, it corresponded to all in the political environment, which is biblical, and it was about absolute democratic and republican theories. Now, I have another book here that goes back, oh, was it 1859, 18, you know, that time frame is Marchmont Needham. And he writes about the English Republic. What was English Republicanism that never actually went into full effect after the English Civil War when Charles I was thrown down and finally executed? And just all of the dynamics that went on there. This was in the minds of the Puritans as they were taking in, and, and actually the Puritans in so many ways, won the day under Oliver Cromwell, who unfortunately got too power-heavy in his head and did not implement these ideas and concepts that were biblically sound of a democracy and republicanism according to the outlines of the Old Testament. Right now, in America, we have lost that full understanding of these truths that go all the way back to the founding of America, that go all the way back to the ideas of who the Puritans were and that they weren't just a bunch of religious people, but in fact, they had clear intellect greater than what de Tocqueville says they had in 1830s in all of Europe. I'll tell you what, the Puritans had more than what we have in all of America right now. So what we need, here's, here's the real hard part for everybody, is that pastors need to read de Tocqueville. People in the church need to read de Tocqueville. They need to read Marchmont Needham. They need to understand the Old Testament and the development of biblical democracy and a republic. Christian, what, nationalism? Jeez, it's just biblical common sense. And are those that are not within the concept of Christian worldview, can they live within that? Sure, because of a thing called grace, a gift, not just a thing, but a gift from God called grace that every Christian should be able to implement. But, as I always say, the theology over the last 150 years, almost 200 years, 
has been perverted. Sam Adams clearly understood the truth in Reformation theology, and he built his ideas around it. So come on back next week when Samuel Adams returns and the Anti-Federalist, they got it right. <laughs> <laughs>